Good morning. We're going to start a brand new series today uh, going through the book of Acts. Uh, Acts being, of course, the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, this book was written by Luke, a man who followed around closely with Paul and his ministry and was clearly close to the uh, original disciples there of Jesus. And he wrote this account of the early church uh, describing Jesus's um, resurrection and ascension and then how the church grew and expand from there. So today we're going to begin in Acts chapter 1 verses 1 through 11. In the first book of Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during forty days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Let's pray and thank the Lord for his word. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is truth. We thank you, Lord, uh, that you have blessed us with your word and the opportunity uh, to know what you have done for us, to know all that you have promised us and given us and all that you have called us to. May we be eager today to humble ourselves before you, to depend upon you and your spirit, your presence with us, and your power at work within us and through us. We need you today, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, of all the New Testament writers, only Luke used what we would call a formal liter literary prologue or introduction as he addresses both this writing and his gospel to a man named Theophilus. Luke also did not refer to his writings as letters, but as books, meaning Luke had every intention that this writing was to be published and distributed, not just to Theophilus, but all across the world. In fact, other than this reference at the start of the book of Luke and then here in Acts, we really don't know anything about Theophilus. Today, many scholars actually speculate that Theophilus may have been a wealthy believer who essentially published Luke's writings, covering the cost of ensuring that Luke's accounts of the life of Christ and the acts of the Holy Spirit were copied and distributed. If this were the case, then it would have been both appropriate and customary at the time for Luke to address both his gospel, the gospel of Luke, and here, the book of Acts, to him. Now also remember that Luke was not one of the twelve disciples. In fact, we actually don't know all that much about Luke at all, as he is only even mentioned by name a few times in Scripture. His writing implies that he was educated, and Paul calls him a doctor. But doctors in Paul's day were not well-known or wealthy. In fact, being a doctor was not a celebrated title in Roman society, but instead it was considered a service job. And most doctors at that time were actually slaves who were given an education by their masters, specifically so that they could serve the upper class in this way. Luke was also a very common name amongst slaves in the Roman world at that time. As such, many scholars speculate that Luke may have been a freed slave 
who had been trained as a doctor, who became a believer, pops, possibly rather early on in, in the history of the church, and gave his life to serving the Lord in the mission of the gospel in whatever way he could. His insider knowledge of what occurred shows that he was close with the apostles and leaders in the church, and his willingness to travel with Paul and stick with him quite often when no one else would, shows his commitment to service and to missions for the sake of Christ. And you know, even though we have no actual record or record of Luke ever speaking, let alone preaching, just the fact that he took the time to write these accounts shows his absolute passion for ensuring that those who came after him would know the truth of who Christ is and what Christ had done, and furthermore, the importance of the work of the gospel through the power of the Holy Spirit. And immediately in this book, the Holy Spirit comes into view as Luke points out the work of the Spirit in and through Jesus' ministry and sums up Jesus' final days before his ascension to heaven, the foundation of which is Jesus revealing himself to his apostles and followers to leave no doubt as to his resurrection. Because you see, the, the entire credibility of the gospel message and the truth of Jesus Christ does indeed rest in the resurrection. In fact, it was the resurrection that the disciples talked about most. Everyone in the area knew that Jesus had died on a cross, but they needed to know that he didn't stay dead. This is why Jesus was so intentional to reveal himself to so many people after his resurrection. There are some who have wondered why Jesus didn't show himself to more people, why, why he didn't just appear in the temple courts or in the holy place of the temple or maybe even on top of the temple. But you have to remember what Scripture says about who he did show himself to. You know, in 1 Corinthians 15, you know, we're told he showed himself to quite a few people, even a group of 500 people at once. Overall, scholars wonder if he showed himself up to as many of us as a thousand different individuals who could bear witness to seeing Jesus resurrected with their own eyes. But we also need to remember that until the Holy Spirit came, most of the Jews wouldn't have been able to recognize that Jesus was alive or why he was alive. For even Jesus' disciples didn't believe it or understand it until they saw him and he explained the scriptures to them through the power of the Holy Spirit. Which note that Jesus' first command to the disciples was not that they should go and tell everyone about what had, what had happened here. The widespread proclamation of the gospel doesn't come until after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. But instead, Jesus' first command to his disciples was essentially to wait to wait in Jerusalem until the Father provided the promised gift of the Spirit, whom we know that Jesus had described to his disciples as being a counselor and a helper for them. You see, the thing that Jesus emphasized over and over again to his disciples, beginning on the very night that he was betrayed before his crucifixion, all the way up to his ascension, was the absolute essential role of, that the Holy Spirit would play in the lives and mission of his followers. In fact, here Jesus says that they would be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, baptized with or in the Holy Spirit is one of those phrases that scholars and denominations like to debate ad nauseum. But I think many misunderstand its emphasis. You know, being baptized with the Spirit is not what happens when a new believer is baptized in water. Being dunked in water is not a requirement for receiving the Holy Spirit, nor is it some sort of special event brought on only by the laying on of hands of select individuals. As we'll see throughout the book of Acts, there are multiple instances in which individuals are not filled with the Spirit until after they meet with the apostles and the apostles place their hands on them and pray for them. But there are far more instances throughout the book where we see the Spirit coming on people the moment they believe. So in other words, there is no formula for how the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in a life, nor is there an exact procedure for how he works in our lives. 
And you cannot possibly reduce the purposes of God to some sort of systematic process. You know, there are others who view the baptism of the Holy Spirit as simply being a one-time event that just happened at Pentecost with the disciples, which as we'll see in a couple weeks, <laughs> there were absolutely some unique things about that event as the Holy Spirit entered into the church and continued to immerse the church and fill the church. However, I think we would do well not to limit the Lord's phrase here to our denominational bent, but instead to look simply at the straightforward nature of what he is saying. That word baptize was a really common word used in Greek in that day for almost any sort of washing or cleansing. It was used in both a religious sense as well as in an everyday sense. The root of that word literally means to cover or to whelm. It also came to mean to moisten or to stain. So what Jesus is saying here is that the disciples would be covered, they would be marked, they would be washed by the Holy Spirit. And you might say they would be immersed in the Spirit. You know, in the same way that a dirty dish dropped in a bucket of water is immersed and covered by that water, so their lives and being would be immersed and covered by the Holy Spirit. Jesus was explaining to his disciples and to us that the Holy Spirit wasn't going to be just like the kind of counselor or helper that you would have to go look for and then submit a request to meet with and maybe get advice from every now and then, but that their entire lives, their entire being, would be immersed, would be filled, would be covered in the presence, purpose, and work of the Holy Spirit of the Lord God Almighty. He was going to be with them completely, and their lives were going to be entirely based in Him. Because what the Lord was calling them to do, and what the Lord is calling us to do, is absolutely impossible if our lives are not first immersed in the Holy Spirit. We cannot possibly walk faithfully with the Lord in obedience to him if we are not living as those who belong to, function, and act only in and through the Spirit. And this was so obvious in the disciples' very response to Jesus here. Notice the question they raise right after this in verse 6, where they essentially ask, you know, Jesus here, so are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel here at this point? I always imagine Jesus taking a deep breath and a heavy sigh. The disciples still didn't get it. They thought that now that Jesus had risen from the dead, he was finally going to march triumphantly into the temple courts and proclaim himself king of the Jews. For Jesus is the king of the Jews, but he is so much more than that. He is the king of kings and the ruler of all nations. He didn't die and rise again just to produce a dramatic coup of the throne of Israel, but to save all of mankind from their sins, that one day, as Scripture declares, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The disciples, however, were still more concerned with earthly things than eternal spiritual things with the things they could see instead of the work of the Spirit. And this would continue to be the case until their lives were completely immersed, filled with the Holy Spirit. For Jesus is abundantly clear here. The times and dates for his return and the establishing of his kingdom in a visual, physical sense is not for us to know, nor is it within our scope of authority to bring such things about. But you know, even still today, Christians get caught up poring over man-made charts and developing timelines and proclaiming possible dates for the Lord's return. Even more so, we all are tempted to act as if we have some sort of authority over God's kingdom, as if it is our role to determine the direction of God's church, God's people, and even the expansion or culmination of his kingdom. You know, we plan, we scheme, we develop programs, we organize meetings, we build buildings and establish teams, and all of this without even a single prayer meeting, without any thought to the Spirit's direction or what He can and will and desires to accomplish. We do it all on our own basis as if somehow it is our work or our authority that advances the kingdom of God. But church, hear me. Do not miss the full significance of, to Jesus' answer here in response to his disciples' concern about earthly things. 
Jesus is saying all authority rests with the Father. The authority over timing, the authority over his kingdom, all authority rests with him and him alone. But Jesus says that our role, our role as followers of Christ, is to receive the power of the Holy Spirit, and then through his power, be witnesses for Jesus Christ. So what does it mean to be a witness? Well, it means to share a testimony of the truth. In this case, of course, the truth of Jesus Christ. You know, like we discussed a number of times in our Colossian study, this is our purpose, to bear witness specifically to the fact that Jesus Christ is alive and, and the salvation he has brought to us. You know, why is Jesus alive and what does that mean for the world? The issue is that so often we as Christians as a whole, though, we're terrible witnesses. Our lives don't reflect the love and grace and salvation of Christ, and we don't seem to bring it up all that often in our speech. We talk about everything except for the one thing God has actually called us to talk about. But I want us to realize today that at this point here in the book of Acts, the disciples were also terrible witnesses. They weren't even great personal followers yet, let alone global witnesses. Remember, after the resurrection, when Mary Magdalene, who was the first person to see Jesus alive, ran to tell the disciples uh, that Jesus had indeed risen from the dead, they didn't believe her. Mary couldn't even convince Jesus' closest disciples that what Jesus had said would happen did happen. In fact, even after Peter and John ran to the tomb and found it empty, they still didn't fully understand. And then after they finally saw Jesus alive themselves and believed, but even then only after Jesus ate some food to prove he was really there and not a ghost, ten of them couldn't convince one of them, Thomas, who I guess was out that night, that they had seen Jesus. The disciples were terribly ineffective witnesses, even just to one another, up until the day of Pentecost, up until they were immersed in the Holy Spirit. The only ones who believed that Jesus was alive were those who had seen him, and often a couple times. Are you catching where this is going? The disciples could not truly be meaningful witnesses for the resurrection of Jesus Christ and all of its gospel implications until the Holy Spirit was working in and through them. And they had even personally seen the resurrected Jesus with their own two eyes. So who are we, who have not seen, but yet are blessed because we believe, Scripture says, to think that we can be effective witnesses apart from the presence and work of the Holy Spirit, apart from submitting and identifying our lives completely to Him? See, the verse most quoted in this passage is verse 8, specifically that last part that says, And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus said that his followers would bear witness to his resurrection to every corner of the globe, beginning with where they were at and spreading out from there. That's awesome. That is the global work that all of us are called to now to be a part of in Jesus Christ. But this calling, this commissioning as witnesses that Jesus' disciples have received is not the end-all be-all, meaning the power to save or change a life and change this world isn't in the mission itself. That power is in and through the Holy Spirit. The mission to be a witness in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria and to the ends of the earth is what the Spirit will lead us to be a part of when we are truly living and belonging to him as those immersed in his presence, will, and power. See, church, this is why Jesus' first command to his disciples was to wait. Trying to accomplish the work of God and be a witness for Christ on our own power, it's like trying to push a truck with a parking brake up a hill. We just don't have the power. You see, part of our issue is we tend to be just as confused as Jesus' disciples were when Jesus ascended into heaven. When Jesus went up into the sky and was hidden behind the cloud, you know, I can only imagine how amazing that would have appeared to them. You know, there were no airplanes back then. The people didn't just get up and fly, and they still don't. But I'm sure this was an incredible sight. 
But they were so enamored with how Jesus had ascended up into the sky that they were just standing around trying to catch a glimpse of him. You know, realize though, Jesus physically ascending like this into the clouds was really just a visual aid for his disciples. Jesus didn't have to physically rise into the stratosphere to go to heaven. But it was a way to remind his disciples once again of his divinity and clearly show them that he was leaving. Up to this point, Jesus had been appearing and disappearing among them. The ascension into the clouds was just an affirmative way to show the disciples, hey, things are changing. Jesus wasn't going to physically be there with them anymore. He wasn't going to be appearing in and out of rooms with them. There was a different counselor coming, and they needed to wait for him. But the disciples just kept looking up into the sky, maybe expecting to see Jesus soaring through the clouds. Notice, though, that these angels here did not appear above the disciples, but amongst them on the ground to draw their attention back to earth. Jesus wasn't in the sky anymore. He had ascended to the throne of heaven beyond all physical bounds of earth and space. And the angels told the disciples everything they needed to know at this point. And that was essentially, don't worry, he's coming back. You don't need to look for him. He's in heaven. But at the right time, set by the Father's authority, he will be back. Church today, more than ever, we as Christ's disciples in this world need to heed the instructions of Christ and the promises of the Lord's messengers here. We need to return our focus to what the Lord has called us to do here and now, all around us, submitting to His Spirit's work in our lives every day instead of trying to arrange our circumstances in accordance with our own personal preferences. Jesus is coming back, and praise the Lord, it will be a glorious day when he does return. But we aren't called to just sit around and wait for that, looking up into the sky with our mouths hanging open. The disciples were told only to wait for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And well, the Spirit has come. We don't have to wait for him any longer. He's here. He's been here. And he is at work. The question is, is your life immersed in him or something or someone else? We know we are called to be witnesses, but our witness is directly tied to the power of the Holy Spirit. If you desire to obey the Lord and be the witnesses he has called you to be, it doesn't start with a plan or a program or a speech. It starts with the Holy Spirit. Are you spending time with the Lord in his word and in prayer? Are you allowing your life to be defined by the Lord and his leading? Are you trusting that he is with you? that the Holy Spirit is guiding you? Are you depending upon Him and trusting in His promises? Because our life will only reflect the life of Christ when the Spirit is working and bearing fruit in us. Only then will our lives truly bear witness to the resurrection. Is your life immersed in the Spirit? Are you depending upon Him? Or are you still trying to do this your way and under your power? Let us trust the Lord and the counselor he has given us. Let's pray. Lord, I confess that I'm not a very good witness. None of us are very good witnesses on our own. None of us have the power to do what only you can do. And it's a humbling thing that you have called us to be a part of your work in this world. That you have given us a role to play as witnesses to your resurrection for the sake of your glory and your kingdom. I pray now that we would stop depending upon our own strength. That we would no longer look to our own devices. But that we would be eager to depend upon you. To submit to you in faith and let your spirit work and move to bear your fruit in our hearts, in our minds, in our speech, in our actions, in our life, Lord. There is no one we need more than you. Thank you for the gift of your Spirit. Thank you for being here with us. May we not ignore you this day, but may we walk faithfully before you. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. 
Go in the grace and peace of Christ and depend upon the Spirit this week.